Let's look at another example. Look at f of x equal to x, x minus 3, over x squared, x minus 2, x minus 4. Now, we start, we just take a look at where the denominator is equal to 0. So it's going to give me the points x equals 0, 2, and 4. We next check to see what cancels out. The x's are going to cancel, but there's not enough to get rid of the x in the bottom. So we note there's no removable discontinuities. We couldn't remove any of those completely. So all of our points here are going to correspond to vertical asymptotes. Next step, draw on our real number line. And I'm going to mark off where our vertical asymptotes are. So I'll put little dashed lines to keep track of those. Then we note in the top, at x minus 3, x equal to 3, we're going to have a 0. So I'll just blacken that in there. At zeros, the sign can change from positive to negative, so I have to keep track of those. OK, we're going to check a point in each region. So what are we going to do? Well, if I'm on this side of 0, I could put minus 1 in. We're going to get a 4 fifteenths out. And then we know that that's a positive number, so this is going to be positive on this entire side of 0. That's going to force the vertical asymptote on that side of 0 to go up to plus infinity, because if it's always positive, you're never going to go negative, so you can't go near negative infinity. So limit as x goes to 0 from the left is going to be plus infinity. For the rest of them, we don't actually have to get the actual value out. We just need to know the sign. Once I know the sign, that tells me everything that's happening in my region. So for instance, if I put a 1 into here, I have negative, positive, negative, negative. So I'm looking at a negative over two negatives. That's going to give me a negative number. So we're negative in this region. From 2 to 3, I could put a 2 and a half in, which is going to give me a negative, positive, positive, negative. So that's going to be a positive. 3 and a half, same idea. Going to give me positive with one negative in the bottom, gives me a negative. And then if I put, say, 5 in to get this region, everything's positive, so we're positive here. So what do we have? When we take a look, well, for instance, if I concentrate on just the vertical asymptote at 0, what are we going to have? We'll have, as I take the limit from the left, as I go into 0, our function is going to go to plus infinity. As I go into 0 from the right, it's going to minus infinity. And then if I consider what's happening on both sides at once, we're going to get it does not exist because our infinite limits are not agreeing. Okay, and then you can play that game for the rest of the asymptotes. Just remember, 3 is a 0, so that's not part of the game we're playing. That thing has an actual point defined there, and it's continuous there. All right, how about the, in general? Suppose you're not looking at rational functions. What if I just have a continuous function over another continuous function? It's going to depend on the functions that you're looking at, but here's some general rules of thumb when your functions are very nice. So let's say f and g are continuous on an interval, and they're nice enough properties. It's going to be the same idea. We're going to take a look at where the bottom function is equal to 0. If your function on top is not equal to 0 also, then that's going to give you a vertical asymptote. If the thing on top is also equal to 0, then you have to worry, does a limit exist? Because remember before, we had to worry, do I have vertical asymptotes or do I have removable discontinuities? So if a limit exists, that's going to say you have a removable discontinuity. If you want to make it continuous, you could plug a point in there. OK, so that's what this says. If you get a limit, removable. If not, you have a vertical asymptote. So if we want to do an example that's not a rational function, I'm going to go to trig functions. And for our example here, it's rigged, so that'll turn out to be something we already know. We just want to make sure we can follow through the arguments. So let's try f of x equals sine of x over sine of 2x. Our double angle formula tells us sine of 2x equals 2 cosine x sine x. And then we know that the sine x's are going to cancel. It's going to be 1 half, 1 over cosine x. And then 1 over cosine x is just secant x. Also note, since I canceled out those sines, I have to throw away every point where sine of x is equal to 0. So I'm going to have 1 half secant of x. And then x is not equal to a multiple of pi. OK, note. Why is that? Well, where is sine of x equal to 0? Sine is going to be the y values for the unit circle. And so that's going to happen. We want to know when, when is y equal to 0. It's going to be 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. So integer multiples of pi. So this is the function I'm looking at. If I graph it, 
Okay, well, we're just going to take our graph of secant. Okay, you multiply by a half, which just scales it so it won't change the picture if you're leaving all the numbers off. And then you note, I have to put zeros or little holes in wherever I'm at a multiple of pi. Let's take a look at what's happening. Where are these vertical asymptotes happening? They're happening where cosine of x is equal to zero. Okay, where's cosine of x equal to zero? Well, cosine remembers the x value for the unit circle. So we're looking at where is x equal to zero in the unit circle. That's gonna be this point and this point, and then every multiple of them. So we're gonna be looking at pi halves, three pi halves, five pi halves, and so on. So you're just taking pi halves and you're adding all your integer multiples of pi to that. So ver vertical asymptotes are gonna occur wherever cosine is zero, and then they're just gonna be start at pi halves and then just start add, subtract pi off of that.